Welcome back to Pod Save the World. I'm Tommy Vitor. I'm Ben Rhodes. Ben, we got a little geographic role reversal today. I'm in New York City where I'm not sure where you are. You look like you're in a hotel. I'm in Vancouver, Canada. And right I just want to thank all the Canadian worldos for this jewel of a city. <laughs> nice. It's a wonderful place. I don't know why everybody doesn't come to Vancouver. It's great. That's all. It's very different from where I am. I stayed uh, near Times Square last night, and I'm I'm pretty sure there was a monster truck rally outside our my room at about midnight. But you know that's okay. It is what it's it is. Times Square, man. I mean, uh, the peep shows are gone now. Uh, well, thanks, know. Giuliani. Yeah. I'll take I'll take your word for it. Um, there is Ben. There's a lot of news in the national security world this week. We're going to discuss the operation to kill Al Qaeda leader Ayman al Uh That is a very big deal. We'll explain why. Nancy Pelosi just touched down in Taiwan. Well, one we're watching closely. Hopefully, it doesn't get hairy over there. We'll talk about that trip, the Chinese response, uh, the latest news from Ukraine. Uh, some hopeful news about grain shipments and calls for the U.S. to add Russia to the state sponsor of terrorism list. And then news about Russian intelligence operations in the U.S. Uh, Trump weighs in on Brittany Griner. We'll highlight some ex- excerpts from a pretty wild profile of Saudi leader Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, one of our favorite people in The Economist. Tensions in Co- Kosovo, uh, some lighter stories. And then in a historic first, Ben, Crooked Media's chief take officer, Elijah Cohn, is going to join us for the first ever international edition of Take Appreciators. I know you're excited about that. I'm really excited because that's like probably my favorite PSA segment these days, so I'm really excited. <laughs> first story, big, big news on the counterterrorism front this week. Uh, on Saturday, the CIA launched a drone strike in Kabul, Afghanistan, that killed al-Qaeda leader and founder uh, Ayman al-Zwahiri. Some background on him for those who don't know. Uh, Zwahiri founded al-Qaeda with bin Laden, and he's been the number one guy or the number two guy in the organization for decades. He was by bin Laden's side as they planned the 9-11 attacks. He masterminded, he masterminded the bombing of the USS Cole in 2000, which killed 17 Navy sailors and injured 37 more. Uh, he plotted the Africa embassy bombings in 1998 that killed hundreds of people. And he has been the leader of al-Qaeda since the U.S. took him out, uh, took out bin Laden back in 2011. So back to the news this weekend. It sounds like what happened is the intelligence community figured out that Zwahiri's family had decided to relocate to Afghanistan and then they figured out that Zawahri had moved to Kabul to join them. Intel folks then spent months figuring out if this was really him. They verify your identity or his identity and pattern of life so they could take him out without uh, a lot of collateral damage, any collateral damage. So this strike on Saturday hit uh, Zawahri with two Hellfire missiles as he was standing on a balcony. Uh, it apparently avoided any collateral damage, maybe by using the kind of missile that targets uh, the individual with blades and not explosives, which is pretty gruesome stuff. But if it avoided collateral damage, I guess that's good. This house he was in was reportedly owned by a top aide to Shrajuddin Haqqani, who is a senior official in the Taliban government. Uh, and this was like the fanciest neighborhood of Kabul, which raises a lot of questions we'll get to in a minute. So, Ben, um, the U.S. government has killed so many like al-Qaeda number threes that it became kind of a yeah. not funny, dark running joke. This is very different. Zwahiri was the the intellectual leader of al-Qaeda. He's been a voice rallying jihadists to kill Americans for decades, literally. My understanding from back when we were in government was we had no clue where this guy was. Like maybe we knew a region, but never a city or a neighborhood like this. So pretty impressive intelligence work. Good news for the world. Uh, what are your initial thoughts on Ayman Zawahiri meeting his maker today? Well, I mean, look, he, this guy is like a world-class asshole. Um, <laughs> like you said, he, he was kind of like the... Uh, bin Laden was the the money guy, the inspiration guy, the front man. Um, Zawahri was kind of the part of the intellectual heft. Uh, I hate to say that, but like he kind of he was radicalized in Egyptian prisons, and uh, his pairing with Bin Laden was kind of the alchemy that led to Al Qaeda. Um, I think Tommy. You know, I was thinking about this. Like he's the last of the core group. I mean, there's nobody left uh, who's not either dead or in U.S. custody um, from the kind of core group of people that put al-Qaeda together. So, you know, (laughs) the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, have been so muddled, um, so problematic, um, such, uh, you know, unsatisfying outcomes, obviously, inside of those two countries. Um, Yet, if you think about it, you know, we went to war after 9-11 to destroy al-Qaeda. I mean, that's why I thought we went to war, uh, 24-year-old me, New Yorker, who witnessed the attacks. And so I think, you know, taking him out kind of completes the destruction of the group of people that did 9-11. So um, I, I think it just bears noting uh, for not just the people who carried out this operation, but for, for everybody who served post-9-11 that 
that core mission, um, despite all the problems with the other missions that were like stacked on top of that by the Bush mm-hmm. administration, um, you know, that core mission ha- has been in some ways completed. Um, that 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 group of people, that group of terrorists that did 9-11 is not around anymore. And that's a big deal. Um, it's cathartic, you know, too, for people who lost family members. It is. I mean, if you were a family member, yeah, exactly. If you're a 9-11 family member, a Cole family member, like, you know, th- this this is a measure of justice. Uh, it took took 20 years, but it, it is a measure of justice. Um, you know, he, uh, how important he was and how important al-Qaeda even is to the global terrorist threat right now, um, you know, is somewhat debatable. Uh, clearly, he was the only one who could still kind of cohere Al Qaeda into an organization. It's already yeah, he been was releasing of, videos. Still. Yeah, he's doing videos. He was kind of a well-known figure. So th- there's nobody who can replace him. I mean, nobody could really replace. But he didn't really replace Bin Laden, frankly. I mean, it's not like Al Qaeda has been on the front burner of the terrorism uh, threat since Bin Laden was taken out. But but this guy was the person that kind of held the organization together. So. I think it just kind of shows the demise of al-Qaeda. Um, it does raise a bunch of questions about Afghanistan, yeah. which we can well, talk let's, about. Let's yeah. get to that. So President Biden announced this operation uh, in a speech last night. He did so from the back balcony of the White House, which I'd, I'd, I've never really seen that shot before uh, because he's still isolating with COVID. Let's play a clip from President Biden's speech. The United States continues to demonstrate our resolve and our capacity to defend the American people against those who seek to do us harm. You know, we... we uh, we, we make it clear again tonight that no matter how long it takes, no matter where you hide, if you are a threat to our people, the United States will find you and take you out. Did seem like that was the message you wanted to send, Ben, which is, you know, it doesn't matter how long it takes. If you conduct operations against Americans, we will find you. Um, Look, I mean, I do think, like, shout out to all the intelligence folks who, who worked on this. Shout out to our, our old colleague, Liz Sherwood Randall, who now coordinates these counterterrorism efforts from the White House. Um, so, Ben, the, you, you alluded to this. The fact that Zawahiri was in a house in downtown Kabul in a fancy neighborhood surrounded by, like, rich people, government officials, and a place connected to the Haqqani family probably tells you everything you need to know about the Taliban government. Uh, U.S. officials were briefing press saying Pakistani officials knew about uh, his movements, too. I would also argue this undercuts like how many years of arguments that the U.S. has to keep hundreds of thousands of troops in some place to conduct counterterrorism missions. I mean, clearly the U.S. departure from Afghanistan kind of smoked Zawahiri out and led him to believe that he would be be safe in Kabul. But clearly that was not uh, a wise assumption on his part. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. It's a bit of a mixed bag Uh, on the one hand. Um, there was this question about whether after the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan, they would not just be creeps and, you know, horrific uh, leaders of, of Afghanistan, you know, denying things like the right of girls to go to school. But there was this question of whether or not they would invite back in terrorists and whether they would kind of return to their pre-9-11 habits of providing safe haven. And, you know, I think this demonstrates that at least elements of the Afghan government are doing that. You know, um, now the Haqqani network has always been the most kind of terrorist or terrorist adjacent faction fighting with uh, the Taliban. Um, and, and I should say, Tom, you mentioned we didn't know where Zawahiri was, which is right. We did presume he was in Pakistan. And, yeah. and so clearly what probably happened here um, and more will come out is, you know, he felt safe moving him and his family from Pakistan to Afghanistan probably at the invitation of some of the Haqqani network. Um, and so that's concerning, right, that the Taliban, the Haqqanis, uh, who, who control a lot of the security apparatus of the Afghan state now, uh, are providing this guy safe. And on the other hand, as you point out, I think it is really important that one of the arguments for keeping thousands of troops in Afghanistan was that we needed that in order to have a counterterrorism capability. And I think the Biden administration can rightfully say, look, you know, this demonstrates that just having 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 Americans hanging out in Afghanistan is not necessary for us to gather intelligence and to take out a really high value terrorist target like this. Um, and, and so, I, I, you know, while obviously things have gotten worse for the Afghan people, um, our capacity to carry out counterterrorism operations in Afghanistan has not been compromised, you know, as evidenced by the fact that we got somebody 
that we couldn't get before like the withdrawal. One of the most wanted men in the world. Yeah, it's kind of ironic. Like, you know, yeah. before the withdrawal, we couldn't find and get this person. And after the withdrawal, we could, in part because he thought that he had greater freedom of movement inside of Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, so to me, it, this suggests that, like, we're in a new phase, obviously, of the, the so-called war on terror. I, I think we don't need to have quite as sprawling an enterprise as we have going with drone strikes in multiple countries. But this one is the kind of target that um, I think nobody would argue with. And I think it demonstrates that while we're going to have to keep a careful eye on Afghanistan because this shows that it has become something of a safe haven for some of these these creeps, um, there is a capacity that the U.S. continues to have, even without those troops, to go after uh, particularly high-value terrorists like those. Yeah. It, w- one, like, one down... Like, I, I think this is... Uh, exactly the kind of counterterrorism operation we want the the CIA and others to be conducting. The one downside I have seen here, Ben, is you know you and I have talked a bunch of times about how we would like to see the U.S. provide some sort of sanctions relief so that the Afghan people don't starve, especially in the midst of a food crisis that we'll talk about later, thanks to the war in Ukraine. I, I think sanctions relief probably becomes nearly impossible to do when the Taliban leadership is harboring the leader of Al Qaeda. Um, something they promised not to do in the Doha agreement that uh, that ended the war and got the U.S. out of there. I mean, I, like, I just politically, I think this becomes incredibly complicated for the Biden administration going forward. It does, although I mean, I would argue that if you're just looking at the kind of fact case of it, um, it's not like sanctions stop them. From, no, certainly from not. Harboring certainly this not. guy, right? So, yeah. like, I I still would argue that better to provide the sanctions relief to help the Af- the people that are suffering the most of the Afghan people under the For sanctions, sure. not For the sure. Taliban, right? So I, I still think that the, the balance of the case would argue that, like, look, you know, the message that was sent here is that we're not going to, you know, constrain our capacity to go after terrorist targets inside of Afghanistan uh, because the Taliban doesn't want us to. I'm sure that, you know, it's not like we were asking permission for the strike. So I think, you know, we can simultaneously hold two thoughts in our head at the same time, like, yeah. We want to do whatever we can to help the Afghan people, and these sanctions are not harming the Taliban, they're harming the Afghan people, and we can continue to have platforms to go after people like this. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I agree with you, but, you know, the politics are The politics are, dumb are sometimes. just got harder. The politics did just get harder. Speaking of hard politics, uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi has landed in Taiwan. Um, the international furor is growing. I think it's gone from a furor to a brouhaha. Or a dust up, maybe? I think we're fully in a brouhaha. Okay, yeah. we're in a brouhaha. So Pelosi is, she's on a trip to Asia with a delegation. They went to Singapore or Malaysia. She's supposed to go to Korea and Japan later this week. But the big news is this visit to Taiwan because it makes her the highest ranking uh, official to visit the island since Newt Gingrich in the late 90s. As we talked about last week, the Chinese are furious about Pelosi's trip because they view Taiwan as their territory. They hate the United States sells Taiwan arms. And Pelosi has been a, a longstanding vocal critic of Chinese human rights violations of the government for decades. Um, and the Chinese have been threatening a strong response if she goes for weeks. So, so far, you know, they are certainly making a show of their anger. We've seen videos of Chinese troop movements in southern China. Taiwan's presidential office said they were hacked or they were hit with a a DDoS attack overnight and their site was down for a little while, which is not a huge deal in practice, but sends a message. And then China announced import bans on 100 plus businesses in Taiwan. There are also reports that the U.S. Navy now has four warships uh, east of Taiwan. So, you know, whether or not there's some big response, like shit got real pretty fast. Um, Ben, the New York Times uh, columnist Tom Friedman, a uh, man you called your mentor, just kidding, had an interesting <laughs> column today about Pelosi's trip that kind of, it, it read like it was um, helped along by the White House. You know what I mean? Felt like there was some yes. input there. Um, Friedman called the trip utterly reckless, dangerous, and irresponsible. Uh, that, that's a quote. He argues the trip is is risking a conflict with Taiwan while the war in Ukraine is very much up in the air, and that that timing is particularly insane. Friedman reports that Biden personally told uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping that if China helped Russia with their war effort in Ukraine, China would lose access to both the U.S. and European Union export markets. And the piece notes that so far China has not provided military aid to the Russians. So the insinuation there being, I guess, that the White House thinks Pelosi's trip could provoke them into helping Russia in some way. The Washington Post reported that the White House actively tried to dissuade Pelosi but stopped short of having Biden ask her not to go. So, Ben, I guess I just go back to our conversation last week. Like, I don't want the Chinese government telling members of Congress where to go and when. I still don't see any real upside in this trip for Taiwan or for the United States. I see a lot of potential downside risk. But what what do you like now this thing's happening? She's in a hotel in in Taiwan somewhere. Like, what do you make of it? 
So uh, I was in a taxi here in Vancouver, and I asked my cab driver about the no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> going down a little. You had me Freeman. for a minute. Yeah, yeah. You had me there. Uh, the world is flat. You know, I here's the thing. Tom I'm gonna zag nice a little bit, man. He's a nice guy. Uh, Go zag I'm, away. I'm gonna zag. I a, a zag from you know. You and I tend to like be in violent agreement about a lot of things. I, on, I. I I kind of support the trip. I don't know. Like I, I, cause, cause here's the thing. I, I don't, I look, I don't, the, the, the decision to go at the outset, we can debate, but I think that the, if you look across the human rights spectrum, right, the way that the Chinese have silenced, uh, criticism, of their human rights record, the way that they have intimidated people from meeting with the Dalai Lama, the way that they've, tried to get countries to kind of cut all ties with Taiwan, the way that they've bullied airlines into like changing the name of Taiwan on their maps from or Taiwan ESPN. to yeah <laughs> Chinese Taipei or something, right? Yeah. Like I'm pretty uncomfortable with that, you know? And, and so once this became a thing, again, I think we could probably roll back the tape and say like, was this the right time for her to decide to go, et cetera. But once they made this a big thing, I think that if she had, kind of canceled her trip, um, it would have definitely fed the perception that Chinese kind of bullying and blustering uh, can can dissuade people from commenting on Hong Kong, on Tibet, on Taiwan, and and, and get countries just to, to, to not engage with the Taiwanese. Um, and, and like I said last time, like if, if the Taiwanese were cool with this, and I presume that they yeah, were, that's a I good hope, question. Yeah, it's a good, it it's an interesting been. question, right? Like, because they're the ones facing the risk, not us, right? right. I mean, well, if there's a war, if World War Three starts, I'm wrong. <laughs> so, like, like, like uh, I will be if but next no week, we're, yeah, if next <laughs> week we're on the the <laughs> podcast and, and there's a military conflict, like, I'm wrong. But if this is cyber attacks and some military exercises and a lot of like demarches, um, I, you know, so what? Like that, that's what they do to try to dissuade people from 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 engaging the Taiwanese or or speaking out on human rights. And, and on the Ukraine point, you know, if, if China's, um, I just don't believe. Like I want to invert the, the the Tom Friedman argument. Like I don't really believe that. Like somehow China was on like the precipice of being helpful in, in Ukraine and. And a Nancy Pelosi visit like tipped the scales on this. So, I think it's not they were being helpful. They were not being harmful, and they weren't like selling drones to the. Yeah, Russians. yeah. Now, I, yeah. I, look, I don't know. I, I've seen no intelligence, <laughs> but I don't know. So I, I, I see. Like I, I think you can argue this one both ways. I, I do think it's worth just like noting the fact that the playbook that they've used for years is to intimidate people out of saying things or traveling places. And that makes me pretty uncomfortable. Like, yeah. why can't she fucking travel to Taiwan? Like, she's yeah. the speaker of the, the house, you know? Yeah, and certainly not... China picked this fight. They, they, they wanted to make this a thing. They wanted to intimidate her. They wanted to bully her, the U.S. government. So, you know, and it's, to a certain extent, me concern trolling back with them is playing into their narrative, and that's obviously not good. No, but you're, look, I, you're... You're probably, I mean, you're right to to raise it, and every all the critics are right. like Peter Barn, like if people want a good like argued case for why yeah, this is pointless, good. check out the Binar thing. He talks to Taiwan experts who also think that this trip doesn't really get anything for Taiwan. So I, I think the the the, the counter argument is like it's not like this really advances the ball that far down the field for for the Taiwanese in any way, um, and and so why provoke the fight when it's not necessary and it's not really doing much. That's to me totally fair and probably you know a lot is true in that argument. I just don't like this idea that we're supposed to accept that because they are going to be assholes about something, um, we shouldn't do certain things. You know, yeah, I, yeah. I think that's a kind of that's a problematic argument. Yeah, it's not great. Uh, I saw a bunch of Republican senators release a statement supporting Pelosi's trip, like twenty five or twenty six of them. Uh, call me, which Senate always makes men. me question my judgment. In, well, in no, I, <laughs> I just love that these guys are pretending that they're really backing Pelosi. They just want to drive a wedge between Pelosi and the White House. And yeah, look, yeah. I don't know, maybe that's smart politics. So we 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 talked a little bit about Ukraine. Uh, so let's go to that. I mean, some some news out of Ukraine this week. First, been some rare good news out of Ukraine. Um, a ship carrying grain left the Ukrainian port of Odessa on Monday, which is the first such shipment since the Russian invasion. Sixteen more ships are planning to follow suit soon. Russia and Ukraine, as we've discussed, uh, supply about a quarter of the world's wheat. They're major exporters of a bunch of other key crops, especially to poorer countries in the Middle East and Africa, uh, and the lack of grain exports due to the war. 
will mean that people in continents far away from the war itself starve to death. Uh, the UN says 50 million people in 45 countries are near famine. These shipments don't solve that problem, but they are a start. Um, and again, remember that this shipment happened because of a, a diplomatic deal brokered by the UN and Turkey that we were worried had already fallen apart because Russia immediately bombed a Ukrainian port after signing the deal. So that's some good news. Here's a few awful updates. Um, dozens of Ukrainian prisoners of war held by Russian forces in the Donetsk region were killed in a missile strike. Russia tried to blame Ukraine. They said this was the result of a, a HIMARS rocket strike. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, Ukraine denied that. A bunch of analysts that made what I found to be an extremely compelling case that it's far more likely that Russia murdered these prisoners themselves and then tried to blame it on the Ukrainians, uh, just the latest in a series of war crimes. Um, a former Putin advisor who actually resigned over the war uh, and left the country is reportedly in an intensive care unit in a European hospital suffering from a neurological disorder. Keep an eye on that one. Uh, and lastly, there's this big debate over whether the U.S. government should label Russia a state sponsor of terror. Ben, what do you make of this state sponsor of terror or SST list debate? Do you think it would matter? Good idea, bad idea? I see that um, it's bipartisan. Lindsey Graham and Senator Blumenthal are calling for it, and so is President Zelensky. Yeah, so this is my, like, zag day, I guess. Cause zag I, I, Yeah, I've been pretty, like, you know, obviously supportive of Zelensky and the Ukrainian government's positions on most things. I don't get this. Um, so there's this symbolic thing and then the substantive thing. Symbolically, they seem, uh, the Ukrainians and, and a lot of the people calling for this feel like designating Russia as kind of a, a terrorist state um, is, is just an important message to send because it kind of delegitimizes, I guess, in some respects, any, well, everything about the Putin government. Mm -hmm. That said, I, I think that's why you have war crimes designations. You know, right. I mean, yeah. what what they're because the definition of terrorism is violence at civilians to have a political effect. And so, sure, you can mount an argument that that's what they're doing, but I, I think you know this is an armed conflict, and Russia's engaged in war crimes. And I think calling them war criminals and opening war crimes investigations and suggesting that you're going to spend so long as it these people are alive who are carrying out these war crimes. We're going to pursue them, uh, and, and they're not going to be safe if they you know, travel places where they could be arrested. Um, you know, that, to me, delegitimizes what Russia is doing militarily, because mm -hmm. what they're doing militarily is committing war crimes when they kill prisoners of war in a missile strike or, or shelling or when they target a maternity ward. Um, the substantive impact of designating them a state sponsor of terrorism, that does carry with it some sanctions that are immediately triggered. Um, and, and and this list, by the way, this list has become so politicized already. It, yeah. Like, if you look who's on it, it's North Korea, Syria, uh, Iran, and Cuba. That's who's mm -hmm. on the list. And Cuba is not... The Cuba it, context is where we've talked about this a few times. Yeah, right? we but, like, even North Korea, like, Pakistan doesn't make the list. <laughs> like, yeah. we just talked about Zawahiri. <laughs> we just talked about Zawahiri, like, he was living in Pakistan. And then you know, Kabul. Uh, with them knowing about it. And then he's in Kabul. Uh, and, 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 and so the, this list doesn't seem to have anything to do with, like, who's actually a state sponsor of terrorism. It seems to be a list of countries that, like, we really don't like for different reasons. And it does carry with it sanctions, including immediate sanctions on other countries that do any kind of transactions with a state sponsor of terrorism. The problem here, if you look at the Biden administration's position, which which I support in, in not issuing this designation yet, is that you talked about grain, right? Um, Samantha Powers on the show made a big argument about how the Russians claim that the reason that there's a food crisis in the world is because we've sanctioned their grain exports, when in fact we have not. We've carved that out. Well, a state sponsor of terrorism thing would sanction countries that are buying Russian grain, you know. Um, so are we are we prepared to do that? Uh, do we want the political kind of effect of calling them a state sponsor of terrorism, creating all manner of bureaucratic headaches about how do you exempt like grain transactions from those sanctions? Mm -hmm. This to me just feels like it doesn't really move the needle that much in terms of pressure on Russia, given all the sanctions we already have on them. And I, d I just don't understand why this is such a focus, to be honest. Uh, yeah, it feels like an easy thing you can demagogue politically, frankly. I mean, you look, I mean, the, the U.S. announced, I think, this week that we're sending another $550 million in aid 
to Ukraine, that brings the total up to $8 billion. So, like, we're doing a lot. There's tons of sanctions on them. Um, ben, I want to read you one headline. Can I say one other thing, yeah. Tommy? But Sorry, I just could if the point is that anybody that w- like willingly targets civilians in military operations is a terrorist, are we prepared to follow that logic? Is Saudi Arabia going to be labeled the state sponsor of terrorism right. because of what they've done in Yemen? Or just designate you know, or, individuals? Yeah, I, I just don't. I, I don't know. I, yeah. I don't. I don't think it's the right approach. Um, I just want to read you a headline that you're going to hate because you seem like you're in a pretty good mood today. Uh, <laughs> this is from the New York Times. Using nuclear reactors for cover, Russians lob rockets at Ukrainians. This is fucking nightmare fuel. It's uh, not Chernobyl. It's a different nuclear reactor that Russian troops have turned into a base because they know that Ukrainian troops can't fire back because they'll risk a nuclear meltdown. So how does that make you feel? How's your vacation now? It's a little <laughs> concerned, Tommy. It doesn't feel good out there. I mean, like, thinking of what we talked about already, like potential war in Taiwan, like a, a, a fascist war criminal engaged in a brutal war in Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, there's a lot going on out there. It, yeah, it doesn't not, feel great. Yeah, that no, doesn't feel great. Uh, okay, speaking of Russia, Ben, this was a, there was a fascinating indictment unsealed last week that I thought was interesting because it detailed efforts by Russian spies to recruit, like, fringe political groups in the U.S. and spread their propaganda. The groups aren't named in the indictment, but the Wall Street Journal reported that they include the African People's Socialist Congress and a group in California that advocates for the state succeeding from the union. Um, the evidence in this indictment includes an email from the Russian guy they indicted to his handlers in the FSB that forwarded along a bunch of news articles and said, you asked for turmoil, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> As a DSU, Messi said uh, uh, last week on Pod Save America, the E in email stands for evidence, so I, I wouldn't say <laughs> notes like that. Basically, the, the FSB pushed these groups to spread their propaganda. They paid for protests. Uh, they tried to coordinate their activity, and then they boost it in, you know, Russian media outlets. So, Ben, I don't know, like a few years ago, I feel like we would have just made fun of this and scoffed at how, like, pathetic these FSB influence operations are. Now, I don't know, you see how quickly, like, the the lunatic fringe it gets to the Oval Office, you know, right? You get the overstock.com guy briefing the president <laughs> with the my pillow guy on the coup plan. So I don't know, maybe we should take it all a little more seriously. Yeah, I, I think, I, I mean, one of the unknowables in the last decade of American politics is how much of the insanity has been a design of Russian trolls, uh, juiced by Russian trolls. I mean, I think the reality is we have deep, problems and dysfunctions in American democracy, mainly on the far right. Um, And so there are all these little fires burning around the country, particularly online, and Russia comes and just pours gasoline on it. I'd love to know, for instance, how much Russia has juiced QAnon, you know? Yeah. Um, Because what's obvious is that they do have a strategy, a kind of chaos theory strategy, where anything that sows division, anything that drives people insane, therefore, so anti-vax movements, QAnon, like the, like Antifa conspiracy theories, kind of you know any fringe group, right and left, but you know I think their favorite uh, flavors on the right, they're they're just kind of coming in and sprinkling some gasoline on it, you know, mm-hmm. um, and I think people should just be mindful of that. And, yeah. and look, it doesn't. I don't have to be like a, like a, a like a internet expert, you know, code reader, to know when I am getting trolled by somebody. Who doesn't seem like a real human being? You yeah. know? Um, Egg avatar, super long handle. Yeah. Exactly. If that's happening to us, like it's happening to a lot of people, you know? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, staying in Russia, uh, the Brittany Griner case is back in the news. I think she's in a Russian court today. Brittany Griner is the WNBA star who has been held in a Russian prison for months and is the subject, uh, reportedly, of a prisoner swap between the U.S. and the Russian government that's been proposed, has not been accepted. Last week, Secretary of State Tony Blinken talked with his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, about a possible deal. Uh, Ben, Donald Trump decided to weigh in on Brittany Griner's case on some shitty podcast. Trump was surprisingly focused on these issues when he was in the White House, when he was president, Ben. I mean, he, I think he liked the instant deliverable. I think he liked the spectacle and immediacy of success in these cases. And he helped bring home an American pastor who was detained uh, in Turkey, as well as uh, ASAP Rocky. He threatened a trade war with Sweden to bring home rapper ASAP Rocky. So, you know, I assume I assume he was really helpful uh, and, and constructive when talking about <laughs> Brittany Griner. Let's hear a clip. He's an absolute one of the worst in the world, and he's going to be given his freedom because a potentially spoiled person goes into Russia loaded up with drugs. 
Uh, that's Trump talking about Russian arms dealer Victor Boot, who uh, is indeed a notorious arms dealer nicknamed the Merchant of Death, currently serving a 25-year sentence in a U.S. prison. Uh, Trump later said, I assumed she admitted it without too much force because it is what it is. Um, I don't know what he means by that. Uh, it doesn't seem like the best read on the fairness of uh, the Russian court system or the way confessions are gotten by uh, these goons. But, G Ben, I, I wonder what changed here. I wonder how he turned so hard against these uh, prisoner swaps all of a sudden. I, I, you know, given his kind of puritanical stance on drugs, I'm just not sure whether he's seen a clip of his son on uh, <laughs> on OAN recently. You know, like Don Jr. looks like uh, he sampled a little bit more than, uh, you know, a, a little bit of cannabis and a vape cartridge. More than cartridge, a vape cartridge, right? yeah. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's yeah. What's so disgusting about this is, you you are absolutely right in the way you frame this. He was obsessed with kind of lifting up this issue. I think it's in part because, like, during the Obama administration, people like him and, and other Republicans would use any hostage to kind of paint Obama as as weak, and and, and so Trump like really made this some focal point of his entire foreign policy. And he invited the families of of, of Obama era hostages to speak at the Republican convention on yeah, the South Lawn member. That. That was dark. And, and to me, what it shows is whether you are somebody who has a loved one who is being held hostage, whether you are Brittany Griner herself, uh, remember, you know, he demagogued and attacked uh, Kim Jong Un for literally killing uh, an American hostage, but then that guy becomes his best friend. Mm -hmm. Like, not that we need to revisit the reality that Donald Trump doesn't give a shit about you, but I think this just just demonstrates his entire approach to this issue is complete and utter bullshit. Like, his track record on this issue wasn't really any better than any other American president. It's a shitty issue for any American president. Either you have people remaining in prison or you have to do very difficult things like engage in prisoner swaps to get them out. It's just hard. And... He's just, you know, pulling back the curtain to show that he doesn't give a shit about hostages. He doesn't give a shit about their families. Clearly doesn't give a shit about Brittany Garner. He has no problem with the fact that there's a a fascist running Russia who's not only holding Brittany Garner, but is like killing indiscriminately people in Ukraine. I mean, it's just, you know, that and the the LIV, you know, Saudi bone saw, you know, golf tournament at his mm-hmm. club tells you a lot. Well, not if you needed to know anything more about Donald Trump, you know, you, you learned it last week. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I think, yeah, he will politicize anything, anyone. I, look, I want Brittany Griner home. Yeah. I want Paul Whelan home. I, I am not thrilled about Victor Boot going free. He's an evil person, but those are the hard choices you make as president. There's no easy option here. Um, but to you, you mentioned the Live Golf Tour, Ben. So Be- Trump spent the weekend hosting the Saudi owned Live Golf Tour at his course <laughs> in Bedminster. It is kind of amazing that Trump was getting protested all weekend by the families of the victims of the 9-11 attacks while Biden was overseeing an operation to kill one of the guys yeah. who planned 9-11. But I digress. Perfect. Uh, the Economist uh, wrote a long, fascinating profile of Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince and de facto leader of Saudi Arabia. Here are a few of the choice excerpts and allegations in the piece. Uh, one, uh, a friend recounted hearing MBS called Little Saddam, I guess by his extended family, it also talks about uh, MBS's partying, saying that, you know, far from a, a strict Islamic lifestyle, there's also cocaine, alcohol, hookers at parties. Uh, the piece says MBS is extremely violent. He's known to smash things, trash the palace. He locked a minister in a bathroom for 10 hours. Uh, more than once, MBS allegedly beat his wife so badly she had to seek medical treatment. And he once sprayed the ceiling with bullets during an argument with, wait for it, his mother. Imagine his mother he's shooting his the ceiling mother. up. His mother. Um, yeah. Again, nice so Ben, this, you know, this is the guy who was welcomed, called a reformer, welcomed to Silicon Valley, welcomed to Hollywood by, you know, both his names. Uh, and that was in 2018 after he had already imprisoned and tortured members of his own family. So good stuff. This is who's cutting your live golf tour check and who is uh, handing Jared Kushner $2 billion for his little investment fund. Yeah, I mean, this guy's a complete and utter sociopath, right? Like beating his wife to seek medical treatment, like firing guns in the presence of his his mother, like locking his ministers in bathrooms. Like, how much evidence do we need that this is not a guy that we should be putting our chips on, right? Whether you're the president of the United States flying over there to fist bump him or whether you're just like some eager, amoral hedge fund person or, or, or whether you're like some columnist looking for a hot take on like the reform agenda in the Middle East. Or going to Davos in the desert. 
Robin Davos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you just, just do not engage this person. This is, this is he might kill you. And, and and by the way, like this is not like again to return to the whole real politique. Like there are we've dealt with autocratic regimes in the past. This guy is like next level, right? Like this this is like a really frightening bad person who like on his personal direction like chops up journalists and like intimidates his mom by firing like machine That's guns a crazy in the air. Anecdote. Like what the fuck is going on? You know? And, and just think about this. Like keep these anecdotes in your head the next time you read some take about how there's so much to be gained from engaging MBS or actually maybe elements of his reform agenda are pretty good or, you know, Phil Mickelson needs like a career reboot, you know, <laughs> uh, like uh, like uh, it's just none of it's worth it. None of it is worth it. And it, it, it makes it, it's a sign of our own corruption uh, more so than this guy's that everybody from the president of the United States to leading columnists to like titans of industry to Justin Bieber like need to be on the take from this guy. Yeah, like yeah. he he thinks that we are so weak that all we will see is his money. And the sad thing is there are too many people that are proving him right. And honestly, this is why this climate bill that we hope will pass soon is yes. miraculous because it will incentivize all this renewable energy, but also prioritize you know domestic production, so we don't have to go hat in hand to little Saddam, this sociopath with a trillion dollars over in Saudi Arabia. The only yeah. reason this guy is important is because there happens to be some shit under the ground that he rules, yes. right? Dead dinosaurs. And noted uh, climate hawk uh, Joe Manchin, thankfully, has stepped up to the plate. <laughs> we, we love yeah, we've yeah. always loved I take back everything I said he's, all, all the expletives <laughs> thrown his he's, way he's my hero he's my hero yeah. uh, Ben some troubling news out of the Balkans this week where tensions between uh, Serbia and Kosovo escalated to the point where the NATO peacekeeping force in the area felt compelled to issue a statement never a good thing when the NATO peacekeeping no. force weighs in uh, the quick backstory for those who don't know Serbia and Kosovo fought a brutal war in the late 90s it only ended after NATO got involved and, and did a lot of bombing uh, Kosovo declared its independence in 2008, but Serbia still insists that Kosovo is part of their territory. The conflict is also sectarian. Serbia is majority Orthodox Christian. Kosovo is majority Muslim. The latest tensions came after Kosovo told ethnic Serbs living in its northern region that they had to get license plates issued by Kosovar authorities, uh, and they would put in place additional border checks for Serbian nationals visiting Kosovo. Listeners might be thinking, that sounds like a dumb little thing to fight about. You're not wrong, but remember that these little bureaucratic issues can quickly become proxies for a much larger, deeper conflict. I mean, think of all the times we've talked about customs checks in Northern Ireland, you know, starting conflict, for example. Um, apparently, some ethnic Serb protesters, in response to these new, you know, license plate rules, et cetera, set up roadblocks. Authorities in Kosovo closed down border crossings that led for you know, calls from calm from everybody, the U.S., the EU, the others, the NATO peacekeeping force that I mentioned before that's been in Kosovo since 99 um, can hopefully calm things down and prevent anyone from doing something stupid. So, Ben, I mean, there's a long, long, long backstory to this one. But, you know, I guess my question for you is basically how worried are you about this conflict uh, escalating? Anything else you think, you know, listeners need to know about the history? And how did Rick Grinnell fuck this up so badly? Trump's I know. Former ambassador. I mean, I was, I was told by Rick Grinnell... Uh, noted peacemaker uh, towards the end of the Trump administration, uh, the Balkan envoy, if I recall, mm -hmm. um, that historic peace was achieved because of some relatively obscure and minor economic Man. agreements that uh, uh, he... Really screwed the pooch. Yeah, I mean, I guess Rick didn't bring peace to the Balkans in our time. Well, and I Mike mean, Pompeo cut this deal with the Taliban that led to them welcoming... I'm in Zawahiri back to the yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, tough like the, day the, for diplomacy. The, the, huh? Yeah, tough for the Trump era diplomacy. I, look, I, I, I think what's really at stake here. I mean, the core of this whole thing is that Kosovo, which is recognized by the U.S. and a, a handful of other governments, but obviously not Serbia, and a bunch of other governments, is de facto independent. I mean, like the, I, there's not some world in which we're going to be talking a decade from now where like Serbia is is governing Kosovo, right? And so. Any step that the, the the Kosovo government takes towards greater control, bureaucratic and administrative control over its own borders, has the potential to be a, a, a flare up, a dust up. I think, in terms of things to watch and things that might be concerning, is Russia has a lot of influence in Serbia. Mm -hmm. um, they obviously hated the NATO intervention on behalf of Kosovo um, back in the 90s, 
and they're looking to kind of cause trouble inside of the borders of Europe in any way they can. And so, uh, n- you know, not to see a Russian hand behind everything, but I, uh, I do think it bears watching as to whether or not this is a pot that Russia may want to stir just to cause problems. Like we've yeah. seen them all they like. It's not unlike what they do online. Right. They, they, they there's not some objective. I don't think they believe that Serbia is going to kind of conquer Kosovo again. But I do think that if they can cause or fuel or add add fuel to the fire of any problem, any flare up in, in Europe, in the West, they're going to do it. And so I'd be yeah. definitely looking at that. And I would definitely not be sending in Rick Rennell, who seems to be taking the pro-Russia line, um, pro-hard line, Serbia line. Um, that's not the way to solve this either. I, I no. think Co- Kosovo has had the support of NATO. Uh, it doesn't mean that everything they do is right. It just means that, like, you know, saying to them, like, you have to go back to being governed by Serbia, nobody thinks that is in the cards here. So yeah. if you could de-escalate this and kind of keep keep external f- pressure from Russia out, like, all, all to the good, but this is something to watch. And you might see other flare-ups in the Balkans where, uh, where Russia has some influence and may want to be pulling levers. Yeah, I mean, the Russian foreign ministry accused Kosovo of issuing these new license plate laws to discriminate against Serbs. So they are clearly stirring the pot. I mean, interestingly, the Kosovo supports Ukraine. Ukraine has not recognized Kosovo's independence. They might want to do that. It would be a shine of solidarity. But look, big, big picture. Don't send a Twitter troll like Rick Grinnell to do your work. You know, <laughs> yeah, send, to be send your someone with some board. experience. A yeah. um, couple more quick things, Ben. Just a quick shout out first to the prime minister of Spain, Pedro Sanchez, who is showing incredible leadership by asking men to ditch their neckties at work to stay cooler and reduce air conditioning bills and energy usage. I have not worn uh, a tie regularly in about a decade, about a decade, I think, but I do wanna thank Spain for their leadership. We could wipe out the scourge of ties from all societies. I met that guy uh, a few a few weeks ago. Uh, Obama was in Spain briefly and, and uh, seemed like a great guy, familiar with the pod. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, yes. So d- another reason to be a big fan. Uh, wow. I didn't even yeah. know that when I wanted us yeah. to give him a, a random thank you. And, 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 and I, I, like, I feel like an idiot, Tommy. Like, I, I put on a tie to do my MSNBC hits, and it's literally the only, like, five minutes uh, a week that I put on a tie. And I'm always like, this is, like, it's time to move on from this. Didn't Obama try? Remember Obama tried to get rid I of ties? I think he did try, yeah. 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 I, I just remember, work. you know, you would be, like, hour 16 at work. And your neck would be like like red and raw and chafing because like you were literally strangling yourself with this stupid tie thing in your yeah. shitty hate ties. dress shirt that I got, you know, three for the price of one at Jose Banks or whatever I did. You were a Banks guy. If I yeah, I, look, I was a broke guy. I, I lived with uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, two, yeah. I lived with two other <laughs> adult Men's males in their thirties. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Fair point. Fair um, point. All right. Well, that's it for the news. Instead of a guest this week, because we're all on the road and we're all kind of a mess, we are going to do something very special. Very different. We are going to welcome on our chief take officer, Elijah Cohn, for a special Worldo edition of Take Appreciators. Elijah, reveal yourself. Oh, man. I'm so, I have my kit. First maiden voyage on this new kit. For listeners of Pod Save America, I should be sounding much better. So that's high quality exciting. audio. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, Elijah, explain to them how this works because the Worldos might not know what Take Appreciators is. Yes. Happy to. Welcome to the first ever edition of the world of take appreciators. This is how the game works. I'm going to share some takes with you all. Mm-hmm. The producers have seen these takes. Tommy and Ben have not. They will react and then they will rate them on a scale of one to four politicos with four <laughs> politicos being the worst. Tommy and Ben, are you ready? Born ready. I'm born ready. Yeah, I've been ready my whole life. And by the way, Ben, don't don't hesitate to go with a full playbook. A full if you playbook. Think it's more than okay. four. Okay. I'll try to I'll try not to be too liberal with that, but yeah. Okay. All right. So, I actually had a Zwahiri story to start, but we kind of covered that in the A block. Okay. Don't worry, I have backup, so I'm gonna jump ahead to number two. This is an op-ed that came out yesterday. It needs a little bit of backstory. It's that Sweden and Finland are trying to join NATO, mm. and Congress is about to vote on that, mm-hmm. which brings us to this piece from a publication called National Interest. It is titled why I won't vote to add Sweden and Finland to NATO. Here's a quote from it. America's greatest foreign adversary doesn't loom over Europe, it looms in Asia. I am of course talking about the People's Republic of China. 
And when it comes to Chinese imperialism, the American people should know the truth. The United States is not ready to resist it. Expanding American security commitments in Europe would only make the problem worse and America less safe. Guys, who wrote it? So I'm such a loser that um, I'm fully aware that Me too, Josh Hawley wrote that piece. Me too. <laughs> yeah, Me yeah. too. That is correct. <laughs> and, and, and fist actually, up to the insurrection. N- yeah, noted uh, fist up uh, insurrectionist, uh, a fascist adjacent, tight shirt wearing, uh, masculine projecting Josh Hawley. Um, so masculine that he's not man enough, apparently, to defend Vinland. Um, <laughs> and, and also so stupid that he somehow thinks that uh, Finland and Sweden joining NATO will somehow harm our capacity to stand up to China. That doesn't make any sense. Wouldn't we want a bigger team in NATO to be able to, to do? I don't understand anything about this. I'm going to go with three politicals just because I don't want to give Josh Hawley the satisfaction of a full playbook. And because as I understand the take appreciator methodology, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's, it's just kind of dumb. It's not like an offensively bad take for the sake of being one. But I don't know, Tommy, you're, you're more experienced at this. No, Ben, I, look, you, you, you read my mind. I mean, I, I just sort of feel like Josh Hawley is kind of uh, fisting common sense and, and reason here <laughs> with this take. And to me, to me, it's just classic, stupid, blow-dried, idiotic trolling from Josh Hawley. I'm going to give him two politicos. I have so little respect for the there guy. I barely even think of him anywhere. He's just jogging around the Capitol, <laughs> running away from insurrectionists all day long. Yeah, I would note, uh, Tommy, as you pointed out, a lot of Republicans actually said they were behind Pelosi going to Taiwan to show strength right. uh, against China. You guys know who was notably absent from that group of Republican senators? Who? who? Josh Hawley. Josh himself. Hawley. The same Josh one who was worried about China. Yeah. Or... Huh. Funny how that That's works. not very man of him. Yeah, man up, Josh. Yeah. All right, on to the next one. This is from a publication that we love, the New York Post. Okay. Uh, It's a couple of weeks old, but I really wanted to bring it in front of you guys. It's an op-ed from Biden's trip to the Middle East. Here's the title. Mr. President, your weakness is making the Middle East more dangerous. All right, Mm. so first... Uh, I need to do a little bit of setup. This piece mm-hmm. makes the argument that Iran talked a big game about enriching uranium under Trump, but the country never ca- crossed the key threshold of enriching it to 60% until Biden was in office. Here's a quote. Today, President Biden is piggybacking on the Trump team's success <laughs> in keeping America out of any new wars in the Middle East and setting new foundations for peace. Sadly, Biden's decision to empower the Islamic Republic of Iran through appeasement increases the odds that the American people will have a new conflict on their hands. You guys want to guess who wrote this? Oh, my God. New York Post. Um, Guest writer for the New York Post. Guest writer. Okay, I'm going to guess Mike Pompeo. Wow, Tommy, right off the yes. bat. Yo, God, oh, man. Oh, I was oh, going to go. With, I should have let Ben answer first. Sorry. No, I was going to go Mark Dubitz. I didn't think Mike Pompeo was so pathetic that he's like writing for the New York Post. What? Okay, here, here are my issues with this. One, there's no there piggybacking on not starting wars. That's not how the world works. The clock starts over fresh late. Two, picking this 60% enrichment threshold is such an arbitrary, like, you know, point along the way to decide, oh, now pulling out of the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal is bad. No, you moron. The problem was being managed by the Iran nuclear deal. You yeah. blew it up. Your president blew it up. Against your wishes, by the way, right? I, my understanding is that they're, Mike Pompeo and all the Committee to Save America goons were briefing the press. They didn't want to pull out of the Iran deal because they knew it made us safer than the current situation. Now, do I wish Biden was getting back into the JCPOA? Absolutely. I think they're making a huge mistake by not doing so. But it ain't because anything Trump or Mike Pompeo did for politicos. Oh, oh, oh. So here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say, to add to that, um, there's such internal inconsistency in the logic and stupidity and, and disingenuousness to the argument, which is why it is classic Mike Pompeo, because he can't decide. He's simultaneously saying that Joe Biden is piggybacking on the Trump policy, which I think we were somewhat critical of Joe Biden on this podcast for doing some of that, right? Like hugging the Abraham Accords, keeping the sanctions instead of going back to JCPOA, and then saying he's appeasing Iran. Like, like 
like the, what is the evidence that he's supplying for for any of this right like he, like and th- this is the message to, to, to the biden people like you don't get credit <laughs> from Never. the mike Pompeo's no of the credit. world for being hard on iran and not going back in the jcpoa right like mike pompeo lit this match they started enriching more by the way under trump it's just like the physics of time. The only reason they reach 60% now is because you fucking lost, Mike Pompeo, because Donald Trump lost. If you'd been there, it would have happened under you. And by the way, like, he forgets that TLAM, like, they, there were missiles fired at U.S. troops by Iran that injured a bunch of U.S. troops. Yeah. Like, it's not like, 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 things were not like hunky dory with the Iranians. They weren't like on their back foot in the Trump years. Everything about this is bullshit and disingenuous and political and self-aggrandizing. I'd give it three politicos, mm. except anything Mike Pompeo says and does probably merits four politicos. Wow. So I'm going I'm to join wow. you in four politicos. Graded not a full curve. playbook. He, he doesn't deserve it. He's Great not important Mike. enough to be a full playbook. He's a, he's a four politico guy. Yeah, you, Ben, you put in some uh, context that I can't believe I forgot there, which is that Trump and Mike Pompeo did start a war with Iran. They killed Qasem <laughs> yeah, Soleimani, yeah. the head of the IRGC. Iran then fired gigantic missiles back that injured hundreds of U.S. troops, gave them traumatic brain injuries. Luckily, no one was killed, but it was literally only because of luck. Yes. Garbage op-ed. Now I'm pissed off, Elijah. Thank you. Uh, No problem. Uh, You did ask for the segment, so... Yeah, Yeah, I did. I I love the segment. I specifically requested it. Yeah, thank you. This is how I have fun. This is like what I would want to do for fun. Yeah, me too. All right. Well, like I said, this is a backup one. It's from... This last one, it's from a publication that I had never heard of before called 1945. Are you guys familiar with the publication 1945? No. Interesting. Uh, I'm not. I don't think so. The big national, year. Yeah, the national interest, uh, I have to admit I am, but 1945, big year, but I'm not well, sure. Yeah. Well, this one's really more about the taker than the publication. Okay. So, <laughs> so this piece is uh, titled, Joe Biden's foreign policy boils down to one word, weakness, which is a great title. <laughs> The article makes a few arguments, but it spends a lot of energy talking about hostage and prisoner exchanges. It obviously references the Brittany Griner situation, as well as several other prisoner exchanges, some from other administrations. Uh, it makes the argument that China has made the Pelosi visit to Taiwan a quote unquote hostage situation. And here is a take and a quote. Instead of incentivizing hostage taking by trading prisoners, the correct response is harsh action, either military or economic depending on the circumstances against those who engage in such atrocities. Deal-making is congenial for terrorists and authoritarians. Severe punishment is not. Anyone want to guess who wrote it? Mm. Man. I'm going to throw out there, because I don't know, is it is it that, that O'Brien guy that was like Trump's national security advisor? It was not, but it is a former who, Trump admin guy. Who was, was like the ASAP Rocky guy, you know? I was going to guess Michael Anton, the guy who wrote that, Ooh. like, 9-11 cosplay. Yeah. We would have stormed yeah. the cockpit thing yeah. about Hillary Flight Clinton. 93 yeah. election. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, um, it is not, nor is it Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> 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 he would have prevented 9-11, as we all know. Yes, yes. This person is arguing that we should go to war to free Brittany Griner, basically. Yeah, that's going to be a lot of wars. Yeah. That's a really smart... Um, it's very apt okay. for this person, yeah. I, I would say. John Bolton? Correct. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I, I talked my way into it through the oh, war man. door. Good for you, Ben. So John Bolton is 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 nineteen forty five. Like I didn't even. That's that doesn't weird. like. Oh. Uh, I mean, it's takes so stupid it got rejected from more notable. Yeah, you couldn't even get in the New York Post. Is that is that like a zine? Is I, that like uh, you know what is going on here? The, the yeah. funny thing about Bolton is like tr- Donald Trump described him better than anyone else. Like the guy's never met a war he didn't want to get involved in or start. You know, I mean th- th- that's what this is a recipe for. He's, he wants to start a war with Russia right now over hostages. He wants to start a war with countless countries. It's a lot of wars. Yeah, it's a lot. We're I mean, going to war to free every American. You Also, you can't start. I mean, we're at war with we were at war with Al Qaeda and the Taliban for a long time, and they still had hostages. That That's not a recipe for success because you can't always kill your way out of these problems. I was on an airplane recently. Are you guys West Wing fans? Like, uh, Elijah, is that, is that? I've definitely seen it all. I haven't watched it in a long time. So like there, I, I was on, it, it's on airplane. So I was watching like an early episode and there's like a, an American who's like hostage somewhere. Right. And, or maybe an American's killed. I don't know. Something. And like Martin Sheen, like goes into a rant, uh, and he smokes cigarettes and he's yelling about like in, in Rome, like the Roman empire would come kill everybody that took a Roman hostage. And why can't he do that? 
It's a little John Bolton and in, in, in Martin Sheen. I did I didn't Interesting. realize that. Yeah. You know, we, we went out to uh, we grabbed dinner last night, me, Love It, and John. And we were, as I mentioned before, in New York. Uh, and I wanted to uh, when when the waiter came to take our order, I almost stood up and and, and said to him, Sir, uh, I know you work in Manhattan. I just wanted to be the first to inform you that the U.S. has conducted an operation. I'm on Al Zawahiri in homage to the, the famous scene in the newsroom uh, written by Lovett's mentor, Aaron Sorkin. But I, Good I, don't know, I didn't do it. Everybody should Google that. Uh, it's the worst the scene I've ever seen. Bin Laden death. Just Google that. I have one question about the rules, Elijah, uh, per the 1945 venue. If a, if a take uh, appears in the woods and nobody hears it, does it mm. exist? You know? Good um, because I, I, I'm going to give this one, uh, if this was like in, like, if this is like a f- comment on Fox, I might give this four politicos, but I think I have to downgrade it to two politicos because of Ooh. the 1945 venue. Okay. I, I agree with that, honestly. Like I said, I had a good one from a guy I know that you guys hate on uh, Swahiri, but uh, we kind of already went through that dynamic. Um, yeah. So this this was a backup, but I understand that it's sad for for John Bolton to get down to 1945. I, I to go just, from being the man who was in the room or whatever that book was called to 1945. Yeah, he's basically yeah. you know just writing in a diary at this point. I mean, I I'm going to give this one Politico because <laughs> it's the least surprising thing that John Bolton wants to go to war for another reason. By the way, Ben, he's also out uh, giving Pelosi and Attaboy. He's part of the chorus of Republicans. I know cheering shit. her trip, you know, which you know, hey, look. Make- I should question issue. my if I agree with John Bolton, I always need to to reexamine my assumptions. I know? think you made some good points, uh, Elijah. That was a fantastic take, appreciators. That was a lot of fun, guys. Thank you for great. bringing this. I'm this, so glad I got to do this. This genius to pot save the world. <laughs> uh, I think that's all we got for today. Um, uh, I'm gonna uh, see you guys next week in person. I hope I'll be flying back. Where's your New York show? Uh, we no, we're just here for the TV hit tonight, and then oh. fly back tomorrow morning, and then um, and back in back in LA, baby. Oh wait, TV hit is uh, Colbert tonight. Colbert, you guys are like that's big time. It's very. very I know you've done it before, but it's still cool. I mean, I, it's honestly literally yeah. shocking that they. Let <laughs> yeah, us on. Yeah, I, have, yeah. I have no idea how that happens or why anyone would want to have us. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think what happens is when you uh, host a talk show for a living. And you can invite guests on who you know you can just like wind up and they won't shut up for eight minutes and they make your life a little easier. Like maybe that's why we're allowed. No, no, don't, don't sell yourself short. Uh, just shut up. And he's a ni- he, uh, I'm, you know, Mike's the nicest like, guy. He's the nicest guy. Yeah. I just an incredibly nice guy. He got, um, uh, he, he, we ran to him when we went to the Obama party that became like the dust up heard around the world because of COVID. Uh, he was there and we all were part of the, the disinvite crew for a while and we're hanging out and talking. It was fun. That's a good disreputable crew there. Very good the disreputable crew. crew. Yeah. It's like Sam Power and Mr. <laughs> Mr. Colbert. Um, all right, well, that's all I got. 